as the United States. And he raised up and looked at me and said, do I have to? <laughs> ABC News coverage of the 2001 inauguration is brought to you by Chrysler. Live from Washington, the 2001 inauguration continues. Once again, Peter Jennings. Welcome back, everybody, to our inaugural coverage. We've kept Diane Sawyer up since very early morning, and while she may be accustomed to it in some respects, not supposed to happen seven days a week. Dan, uh, we're going to let you go home in a moment, but before you go, I want to talk a little bit about your own history in the White House, because you have a better perspective than most. You worked in the White House. Tell us briefly, before you leave, the importance of managing the White House and how you think George W. Bush, based on what you know, will do. Well, first of all, I want to say to the really important question of the day that I'd like to bet $10 to Ted Koppel and Barbara Walters that it's peacock blue. That's all right. right. I'm on your side. Okay. Okay, and I I'm expect them to pay up. Two peacocks versus two teals. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and of course, what we know famously about George Bush, he is a business school graduate, that he prizes efficiency. He has said, and I think it's sort of a remarkable thing for him to tell members of his administration in Texas, return each other's phone calls before you call me. See if you can't figure it out yourselves before you call me. He thinks it's very important for him to stay attentive for the main things and not to get distracted by the small things. And as we know, you know, if you have a vision, if you have a purpose, that kind of efficient management style is great. I want to say something else to you, Peter, because I saw the president-elect yesterday for a few minutes, and I thought what he said to me was so interesting. Something that is going to be such a hallmark, I think, of these two people in the White House is the way he feels about his wife, Mrs. Bush, and he talks about her constantly. But yesterday, he had a series of people lined up waiting to see him, and he said, I will not be late for Laura Bush's event today. And he was ready to walk out on anybody to be there for her. Well, Diane, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. We're doing such a great job on yet one more day of the week. I hope you get dry and warm fairly soon. <laughs> Diane Sawyer has been on the roof of the hotel overlooking the White House, for which they shall never forgive their executive producer, I think. This is Mrs. Bush, who's always been wearing Barbara Blue and former President George Herbert Walker Bush, now arriving at the Capitol, going through the law library entrance now to wait for their son to conclude having coffee with Bill Clinton, Al Gore, and Dick Cheney and get in their limos and ride that just under two miles up to the Capitol. But what Diane says gives rise, I think, while we have these quiet moments of coffee in the White House, to talk a little bit about the early days and style in the White House. George Stephanopoulos is with us. George, we know from the program that you were on with Ted Koppel earlier uh, last week that there was chaos in the Clinton White House in the early days. Peter, before we even got to the White House, I envy the Bush people this morning as I, lo as I watch and think back to eight years ago. Not only was uh, Governor Bush on time uh, this morning instead of being 27 minutes late, but his speech was done from all accounts uh, many days ago. And eight years ago today, Peter, I think we were up until about five or six in the morning with the final practices and the final revisions uh, of the speech. Um, and, and it's true, in those early days, we wanted to come in there and focus on the economy like a laser beam, but the early days of the White House were overwhelmed by the controversies about Zoe Baird and Kimball Wood, uh, the Attorney General nominees, and of course the conflict with the military over gays in the military. And dare, dare I think, George, that it was also because you were all so young and you were just so <laughs> excited about being in the White House, you couldn't get down to work properly? Well, I don't know. We were forced to get down to work pretty quickly in those few days, but I think that was certainly part of it. We were Many of us were young and excited, and there's a strong contrast here with the Bush uh, White House, which has a lot of old hands from President, the elder President Bush's um, uh, administration, Andrew Card. George W.'s chief of staff was a deputy chief of staff in President Bush's administration. Of course, Dick Cheney was a chief of staff in the Ford administration and then Secretary of Defense. George W. Bush has put together a good mix of Texas loyalists like Karen Hughes and Paul Rove and these old hands from previous administrations. And I think they're frankly trying to draw a real stark contrast from the younger uh, early days of the Clinton administration. George, I have one question for you which may be absolutely basic, but why? Why do presidents feel the need? And we, those of us who work on television understand it can be a sometimes challenging medium. But why do presidents practice their inaugural speeches so relentlessly in front of the staff? 
Well, the same reason all of us practice what we do every day, I think. This is their one moment where they're introduced to the country. And it's really the speech, and you were talking about this a little bit earlier, where people are looking for some poetry, where the country is looking for some poetry and kind of a, a tone to be set for the next four years. It's not, it's not a policy speech. And frankly, Peter, because they're nervous. I mean, we've all talked about these moments of transition when the president takes the oath. And I think that immediately after you take the oath, when you have to address the country and perhaps as importantly, the world, it's, in, it's hard not to have a lot of anxiety. Thank you, George, very much. I will continue this. And if there's one line giving away speech, one line I think the Bush would like us in the country to listen to in this particular speech. It's the general notion of listening to the heart, listening to the new president's heart. Now, the former Clinton social secretary, Ann Stock, reflects on the morning of the first Clinton inauguration as well. They were preparing to meet the Bushes for the traditional White House coffee, and Mr. Clinton was, says, 27 minutes behind schedule. The Clintons were getting ready to go to the White House to meet with President and Mrs. Bush before they go to the Hill. And I know that the President was ready before everybody else was, and he was standing at the door of Blair House, basically going, Chelsea, Hillary, come on, we need to go to the White House. And then they walked out of Blair House, and there they were. They crossed the street uh, to go in and meet President and Mrs. Bush. There's an exquisite new treasure for the fish connoisseur. New fancy feast seafood fillets, the ocean. Harder to see from that shot. But this is one of the great views in, in, in American history. Looking east down Pennsylvania Avenue from the Treasury Building and the White House end. And it's a little hard at this point to get a sense of how considerable the crowd is. But in the past, Sam Donaldson was talking about uh, the Reagan inauguration, which was so cold they moved it inside. In the past, it's, it's not been the weather which has driven people particularly to stay away. And we'll have a lot of chance in a little while from now to talk about this extraordinary place where the inauguration will actually take place. We're waiting, of course, for the Bushes and the Clintons and the Cheneys and the Gores to finish their coffee in the White House and then the President and the President-elect will get a limousine and go up and those conversations are always uh, fascinating. I want to talk uh, briefly while we're waiting now. I don't think we'll get caught to Ted Koppel again. Ted, I was talking to George earlier about the series you did on Nightline reviewing the Clinton years. And some of that which I found most compelling were indeed the private experiences that none of us have had access to. What one struck you most? Well, if I may, Peter, I'd like to quickly defer to George because... Uh, I'll he, defer to George. He you was, tell me what you found most moving. Uh, he, was, he was talking about a particular moment uh, when, in fact, the transition that we've been talking about all seemed to hit the new president, Bill Clinton, between the eyes. I, 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 I don't want to take it away from George. Well, it was, it was the morning of the fourth of President Bush, uh, Ted, and it was the briefing he had with Brent Scowcroft, who was President Bush's national security advisor. Mr. Scowcroft came in, he met privately with President Clinton, of course, that have come before me, and so many will follow. We have a place, all of us, in a long story a story we continue, but whose end we will not see. It is a story of a new world that became a friend and liberator of the old. The story of a slaveholding society that became a servant of freedom. The story of a power that went into the world to protect but not possess, to defend but not to conquer. It is the American story a story of flawed and fallible people united across the generations by grand and enduring ideals. The grandest of these ideals is an unfolding American promise that everyone belongs, that everyone deserves a chance, that no insignificant person was ever born. Americans are called to enact this promise in our lives and in our laws. And though our nation has sometimes halted and sometimes delayed, 
we must follow no other course. Through much of the last century, America's faith in freedom and democracy was a rock in a raging sea. Now it is a seed upon the wind, taking root in many nations. Our democratic faith is more than the creed of our country. It is the inborn hope of our humanity, an ideal we carry but do not own, a trust we bear and pass along. And even after nearly 225 years, we have a long way yet to travel. While many of our citizens prosper, others doubt the promise, even the justice of our own country. The ambitions of some Americans are limited by failing schools and hidden prejudice and the circumstances of their birth. And sometimes our differences run so deep, it seems we share a continent, but not a country. We do not accept this, and we will not allow it. Our unity, our union, is the serious work of leaders and citizens and every generation. And this is my solemn pledge. I will work to build a single nation of justice and opportunity. I know this was in our reach because we are guided by a power larger than ourselves who creates us equal in his image. And we are confident in principles that unite and lead us onward. America has never been united by blood or birth or soil. We are bound by ideals that move us beyond our backgrounds, lift us above our interests, and teach us what it means to be citizens. Every child must be taught these principles. Every citizen must uphold them. And every immigrant, by embracing these ideals, makes our country more, not less, American. Today, today we affirm a new commitment to live out our nation's promise through civility, courage, compassion, and character. America at its best matches a commitment to principle with a concern for civility. A civil society demands from each of us goodwill and respect, fair dealing, and forgiveness. Some seem to believe that our politics can afford to be petty because in a time of peace, the stakes of our debates appear small. But the stakes for America are never small. If our country does not lead the cause of freedom, it will not be led. If we do not turn the hearts of children toward knowledge and character, we will lose their gifts and undermine their idealism. If we permit our economy to drift and decline, the vulnerable will suffer most. We must live up to the calling we share. Civility is not a tactic or a sentiment. It is the determined choice of trust over cynicism, of community over chaos. And this commitment, if we keep it, is a way to shared accomplishment. America at its best is also courageous. Our national courage has been clear in times of depression and war when defeating common dangers defined our common good. Now we must choose if the example of our fathers and mothers will inspire us or condemn us. We must show courage in a time of blessing by confronting problems instead of passing them on to future generations. Together we will reclaim America's schools before ignorance and apathy claim more young lives. We will reform Social Security and Medicare, sparing our children from struggles we have the power to prevent. And we will reduce taxes to recover the momentum of our economy and reward the effort and enterprise of working Americans. We will 
build our defenses beyond challenge, lest weakness invite challenge. We will confront weapons of mass destruction so that a new century is spared new horrors. The enemies of liberty in our country should make no mistake. America remains engaged in the world by history and by choice, shaping a balance of power that favors freedom. We will defend our allies and our interests. We will show purpose without arrogance. We will meet aggression and bad faith with resolve and strength. And to all nations, we will speak for the values that gave our nation birth. America at its best is compassionate. In the quiet of American conscience, we know that deep, persistent poverty is unworthy of our nation's promise. And whatever our views of its cause, we can agree that children at risk are not at fault. Abandonment and abuse are not acts of God. They are failures of love. And the proliferation of prisons, however necessary, is no substitute for hope and order in our souls. Where there is suffering, there is duty. Americans in need are not strangers. They are citizens, not problems, but priorities. And all of us are diminished when any are hopeless. Government has great responsibilities for public safety and public health, for civil rights and common schools. Yet compassion is the work of a nation, not just a government. And some needs and hurts are so deep, they will only respond to a mentor's touch or a pastor's prayer. Church and charity, synagogue and mosque lend our communities their humanity and they will have an honored place in our plans and in our laws. Many in our country do not know the pain of poverty, but we can listen to those who do. And I can pledge our nation to a goal. When we see that wounded traveler on the road to Jericho, we will not pass to the other side. America at its best is a place where personal responsibility is valued and expected. Encouraging responsibility is not a search for scapegoats. It is a call to conscience. And though it requires sacrifice, it brings a deeper fulfillment. We find the fullness of life, not only in options, but in commitments. And we find that children and community are the commitments that set us free. Our public interest depends on private character, on civic duty and family bonds and basic fairness, on, on uncounted, unhonored acts of decency, which give direction to our freedom. Sometimes in life we're called to do great things, but as the saint of our times has said, every day we are called to do small things with great love. The most important tasks of a democracy are done by everyone. I will live and lead by these principles to advance my convictions with civility, to pursue the public interest with courage, to speak for greater justice and compassion, to call for responsibility and try to live it as well. In all these days, ways, I will bring the values of our history to the care of our times. What you do is as important as anything government does. I ask you to seek a common good beyond your comfort, to defend needed reforms against easy attacks, to serve your nation beginning with your neighbor. I ask you to be citizens, citizens not spectators, 
citizens not subjects, responsible citizens building communities of service, and a nation of character. Americans are generous and strong and decent, not because we believe in ourselves, but because we hold beliefs beyond ourselves. When this spirit of citizenship is missing, no government program can replace it. When this spirit is present, no wrong can stand against it. After the Declaration of Independence was signed, Virginia statesman John Page wrote to Thomas Jefferson, we know the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Do you not think an angel rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm? Much time has passed since Jefferson arrived for his inauguration. The years and changes accumulate, but the themes of this day he would know. Our nation's grand story of courage and its simple dream of dignity. We are not this story's author who fills time and eternity with his purpose. Yet his purpose is achieved in our duty, and our duty is fulfilled in service to one another. Never tiring, never yielding, never finishing, we renew that purpose today to make our country more just and generous, to affirm the dignity of our lives and every life. This work continues, the story goes on, and an angel still rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm. God bless you all, and God bless America. Vice President Gore, it goes into the history books, the 43rd President of the United States inaugural address, January the 20th, 2001. Please stand now as Pastor Kirby John H. Caldwell will now deliver the benediction. And afterward, please remain standing for the singing of our national anthem, after which the ceremony will be concluded. I call upon Senator Dodd to organize the presidential party after the ceremony has ended to depart the platform. Pastor Caldwell. From the United Methodist Church in Houston, a spiritual advisor to President Thank Bush. Thank you, Senator McConnell. Let us pray, please. Almighty God, the supply and supplier of peace, prudent policy, and nonpartisanship, we bless your holy and righteous name. Thank you, O oh God, for blessing us with forgiveness, with faith, and with favor. Forgive us for choosing pride over purpose. Forgive us for choosing popularity over principles. And forgive us for choosing materialism over morals. Deliver us from these and all other evils and cast our sins into your sea of forgetfulness to be remembered no more. And Lord, not only do we thank you for our forgiveness, we thank you for faith. Faith to believe that every child can learn and no child will be left behind and no youth will be left out. Thank you for blessing us with the faith to believe that all of your leaders can sit down and reason with one another so that each American is blessed. Thank you for blessing us with the faith to believe that the walls of inequity can be torn down and the gaps between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, the uneducated and the educated can and will be closed. And Lord, lastly, we thank you for favor. We thank you for your divine favor. Let your favor be upon President Clinton and the outgoing administration. 
may they go forth in spiritual grace and civic greatness. And of course, O oh Lord, let your divine favor be upon President George W. Bush and First Lady Laura Welch Bush and their family. We decree and declare that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Let your divine favor be upon the Bush team and all Americans with the rising of the sun and the going down of the same. May we grow in our willingness and ability to bless you and bless one another. We respectfully submit this humble prayer in the name that's above all other names, Jesus the Christ. Let all who agree say amen. Kirby on Caldwell from Texas. And now Staff Sergeant Malley will sing the national anthem. to think about. We live in the year 2001. The White House website has changed. Clinton is gone and Bush is in. inaugural speech of President Chance to write the history of his administration before it begins, as more than one person has observed on the eve of an inauguration. An opportunity for the country to absorb it and see what it means to individuals. And one could even argue the obligation of historians and journalists to have something to say about it. So as President Bush leaves the podium to go on to his next event. It was about 14 minutes long, by the way, certainly not the shortest. George Washington's was the shortest at 135 words, nor was it the longest. Henry Harrison's, which took 45 minutes to deliver, but it was shorter than Bill Clinton the first time and just about the same time as Bill Clinton the second time. Let me begin to canvas my colleagues here, beginning with our resident historian at ABC News, Michael Beschloss. Michael, what did you hear? Well, one thing I heard, Peter, is that this is a president who understands that a president has to be two things, both a chief of state and a political manager. Very been elected by a much, much larger margin. Two other things. This was someone who at the beginning used that phrase, the peaceful transfer of authority. Almost exactly the same phrase was used by John Kennedy in 61, Richard Nixon in 69, two men who also came in after very close elections. The other thing was he began the speech by thanking President Clinton for his years of service to America. Once again, in almost exactly those words, that was the way that Bill Clinton thanked his predecessor, George Bush, senior, in 1993. We'll stay with history first, and then we'll go to politics from Columbia University, Professor Henry Graff. It was a beautifully hewn speech. It, it showed the marks of, I think, uh, several speechwriters. 
Uh, it didn't entirely sound the way President Bush talked during the campaign. The words flowed more generously and more smoothly. Uh, it set a precedent in that as a president who grew out of a disputed election, he had nothing to say about that fact aside from his gracious reference to uh, former Vice President Gore at the very beginning. Unlike a previous president, well, who said, I apologize for the circumstances of his election. <laughs> that's right. Uh, John Quincy Adams said, I am less possessed of your approval than my predecessors. And uh, similar words were spoken, although not uh, in the same fashion, by uh, President Hayes in 1877 when he said uh, there are differences, this has all been settled by uh, arbitration and we must go on. Thank you, Henry. George W. Bush, of course, has said all repeatedly since the end of the campaign. He believes he has a mandate, even though the country sometimes does, on occasion, criticize it. Some political analysis. Former Congressman John Kasich, Republican member of Congress. Well, Peter, it's uh, the reason why when I dropped out of the race for president, I endorsed George Bush. I think what we heard today was compassionate conservatism. And when we think about what he had to say, his message is, we have to help one another. He referred to the Good Samaritan, we shall not pass by. He talked about the fact that many Americans felt a, a, a lack of justice in America, that he wanted a remedy. He said that children shouldn't be left behind, that children are important, that no one in America is born insignificant. I mean, these are the words that really appeal to Democrats. I think it was a, a very lifting speech. And uh, I think he delivered it very, very well. But I think he carves out, there's things he believes in, that this generation has an obligation to do things to help the next generation. But all in all, it was a matter of calling on Americans' better angels to participate, not as observers, but as citizens, to help move our country forward. Thank you, John. I'll throw my hat in the ring in only one respect. I think it's probably the best speech that we've heard him give, I think better than the speech he gave at the Republican Convention. George Stephanopoulos, I wonder if, as the Republicans had suggested, we might, did you hear his heart? Oh, I think definitely, as, as John Kasich said, when he talked about the parable of the Good Samaritan, when he talked about people reaching out uh, to their neighbors. And Peter, I think you also saw the legacy of his family there. Uh, back in President Bush's inaugural, back in 1989, uh, President Bush talked about a new engagement in the lives of others, a new activism. You saw the same sort of, of language today uh, from the new President Bush when he talked about compassion can't be just a matter of government. It has to be people reaching out and serving their neighbors. That is a strong ethic, a strong tradition of the Bush family. Ted Koppel, I noticed, I think counted six times an emphasis on civility. I wonder if the theme thing struck you. Absolutely, and that clearly was one of the, uh, the principal themes of the speech, Peter, but I, I take held uh, issue with what Professor Graff was saying before. While President Bush refers specifically to the fact that he uh, did not win this election in terms of the popular vote, I think the entire first third of the speech was sort of dedicated to those who quite clearly did not vote for him the disenfranchised, particularly African-American poor in this country. And I think the thrust of the speech in some large measure was, I know I may not have been the man that you voted for, but I'm going to be your president and I'm going to be here for you. I think that was really one of the major themes of this speech. And certainly a theme that the, uh, that the new president uh, has reinforced in all the public appearance he has made since the... that Al Gore conceded and I think perhaps what touched me the most watching all of this was Al Gore's face at the moment that uh, Mr. Bush was sworn in. That's a tough, tough moment. Uh, and, and I do agree uh, very much with Ted that, that he campaigned, George uh, W. Bush campaigned on unity, but his election created disunity, and he knows that. He also knows, although he doesn't watch television, that the image that most Americans have of him is a buffoon, a man who was perhaps silly, and a man who was not too swift. When I met him eight months ago to do an interview, I wasn't very impressed. And this time I was by his 
confidence and his knowledge. So comics may still poke fun, but today George W. Bush became not just a president, but presidential. Thank you very much, Barbara Walters. Sam Donaldson, you've heard so many of them. Sam, I wonder if you were struck at all by the deep connection, though we've heard it before, to his fate. I didn't get the last Peter because a Marine band is struck up right behind me. Well, Would you try me again? Just talk, Sam. All right. I, I think this speech may be known as the speech of the four C's. Courage, compassion, uh, character, and civility. Ted talked about civility. I think uh, when uh, President Bush talked about character, been a little uncomfortable for former President Clinton because uh, Bush during the campaign made it very clear that he was going to restore character and morality in the White House. But I also like Barbara. Peter was struck by the moment when Al Gore was listening to this. And I recall a story that Newton Minow, who was the FCC chairman in the Kennedy administration, tells. He said a few months after President Kennedy's inaugural address, he ran it in Richard Nixon, the man who'd been defeated. M Mr. Nixon said, you know, that was a good speech. I would like to have given it myself. And Nixon said, you mean the F part? And Nixon said, no, the I do solemnly swear part. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. I don't know what we do without your institutional memory. The person who's going to develop institutional memory for us now is Terry Moran, who's going to be in the White House for the Bush administration. And Terry, you know more about the genesis of his speech than most of us. What did you think? Well, Peter, I was struck by the way he delivered it. This, there, I've been seeing President Bush now over the past couple of weeks in an almost serene frame of mind, it seemed. There was, there was just something so calm about him, and he got up there and delivered this well-crafted speech with that same inner calm and confidence. The quality of his voice, and a voice is a tool that a president must use, was quite crowd as well. He doesn't have the mellifluous baritone of President Reagan or the, the charming drawl as Senator Warner hops over the balustrade here. Peter, I'll toss it back to you. One more thing. I did notice something that the cameras may not have caught. Terry, as let me, Terry, let me yes. come back to you, if I may, because this is a big moment for the country. Vice President Cheney and Mrs. Cheney saying goodbye to former Vice President Gore and Mrs. Gore. And it would be hard on this occasion not to dwell for some time, as my colleagues have, on how Mr. Gore has struggled through these post-election days. A man who, even during the recount in Florida, would spend hours and hours every day on the phone and on the email talking to people all over the country, talking particularly to the press, went completely to ground uh, in these final days and has led a very private, almost out of the way life. As I said earlier, he'd been out in Aspen, Colorado briefly, but now he is no longer the vice president of the United States. Some people, George Washington foremost among them, may indeed have yearned for the shade of retirement but not Al Gore, and certainly not Bill Clinton. It is said sometimes in jest, it is said in jest that when they go to the White House this afternoon, they'll see Mr. Clinton's fingernails on the floor as he was dragged from the White House. That's not meant meanly, it is simply to reaffirm, reaffirm what he has always said, that he has, even in the worst of times, loved every minute of his eight years in office. That's been a very difficult last 24 hours for him, having to make a deal with the independent counsel in order to have the investigation of his honesty in regarding Monica Lewinsky go away, at least go away legally. But now he is no longer the president of the United States. It's been traditional in recent years for the departing president to get into a helicopter, take a tour of Washington and disappear into the new phase of their life on this occasion because of the weather. Mr. Clinton and Senator Clinton will go by limousine to Andrews Air Force Base and fly to, to New York.
This, by the way, is only the third time in history that there are five living former presidents. Mr. Clinton, former President Bush, President Reagan, as you know, is still in the hospital in California, having fallen and broken his hip. Jimmy Carter, who was here today, and former President Gerald Ford. I do not, to be honest, know where he is today. He spends a lot of his time at home in Colorado. But the country has now made this extraordinary transition. Some former presidents live long lives after exi exiting the White House, including Herbert Hoover, who lived for almost 32 years, Bill Clinton's. We've been talking a lot about Bill Clinton's age in the last couple of days because they've been trying to figure out how well or not well he in in retirement, notwithstanding the fact that he may someday run again for public office. But now all of the attention will focus on George Bush, who's back into the Capitol now. And I very much want to hear Cokie Roberts' views on the speech and the grand occasion which was... So we'll be right back. Live from Washington, the 2001 inauguration will continue in a moment. Eclipse gum. Now in Polar Ice, Eclipse kills the toughest taste for good. Your eyes deserve the very best protection. At Lens Factors, we think everyone deserves one of the very best lenses around, like featherweights. Featherweights are thin and light, but they're also safer, 10 times more shatter resistant than plastic lenses. Featherweights at Lens Crafters. Hey world, I'm back. Know that old saying about diarrhea? Just let it run its course. I listened to that for so long. Today, I did what was right for my body. I took control. I took Imodium. Why so? Imodium AD can stop diarrhea safely and gently, often in just one dose. Imodium AD. Restore yourself. Learn from the makers of Imodium. Probiotica, the dietary supplement that promotes digestive health. I, of course, was there with my sister to see our father sworn in, and I been in a sledding accident and had this great big black eye. So there were a lot of pictures taken that day of David, who was eight years old, looking intently at me, and I was eight too. And later when we got engaged, years later, the press resurrected these pictures saying, see, he was interested in her. And I, of course, I had to admit that the only thing he was really interested in was that black eye, because it was very dramatic for a girl. But there was a little romance at that inauguration, I, I think so. The 2001 inauguration continues after this from our ABC stations. Tuesday's Blue is an episode Danny Sorensen. You take off last night, you don't come back. I'm tired of it. Won't forget. Diane, hang back and cover us in case we lose it. You hang back. Diane, I'll... Danny, don't ever do that again. With 18 more all new episodes in a row. Just gets better. That's why beat Blue. ABC Tuesday. Viewer discretion advised really good. Our viewers are always telling us their concerns about public education. That's why ABC 3340 urges you to take part in our school needs. Each week we feature the needs of a school in our viewing area. Then viewers can call the school and donate any item on the wish list. Not only will you be helping our school, you'll be investing in our future. Our School Needs, brought to you by Alagasco, Buffalo Rock Pepsi, Piggly Wiggly, Trinity Contractors, and ABC 3340. Hi, this is meteorologist. Don't forget, you can hear my weather forecast every weekday on the radio in Birmingham on Magic 96 FM, WMJJ with Rob and Shannon. ABC 3340 is committed to protecting your family when storms threaten, providing critical information that can save your life, and we use state-of-the-art equipment for the most accurate weather forecast. Count on the ABC 3340 storm team to protect you. Severe weather coverage, brought to you by Alagasco and ABC 3340. John Olchu, only on ABC 3340.
Live from Washington, the 2001 inauguration continues. Once again, Peter Jennings. Welcome back to our uh, inauguration coverage, 2001, running just about on schedule now. On a nasty, but it could be worse kind of day in Washington. The crowds are thin. There have been some difficulties between the police and the demonstrators. The demonstrators want to be and simply want to do damage as best we can tell from the reports of down there on the street. Uh, but in a short while now, from uh, Pennsylvania, the edges of Pennsylvania Avenue, the inaugural parade will begin, which I have to tell you, I always think is one of the great moments of, uh, of any political year of any year, and we will be here for that. And Mr. Bush and Mr. Cheney are now going in to have lunch with the political leadership of the Congress, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But what is very striking, I think, to, to all of us in the country and to a great many people elsewhere in the world is how quickly, as we've said, how quickly the political leaders of the day are eclipsed and passed into a new era of their lives. So before I lose, Terry Moran over there at the White House is going to cover Mr. Bush. I want to remind folks that Terry, of course, has spent months and months and months living in the immediate shadow of of Al Gore. How's he doing, Terry? And what did you think most of all today? Because you know him better than most of us. Well, he's a hard man to know, Peter. He's a very guarded man. But, but I will say, since uh, the end of the contest, there's no question he has conducted himself with great uh, graciousness and good humor. And there's also a sense, as he walked in today, that this was a very difficult time for him. He did not look uh, at uh, President Bush now during much of the speech. There was one moment in particular that struck me. As he walked in, he went over to his seat, and just behind him was standing the Chief Justice of the United States, uh, William Rehnquist, who thrust out his hand for a handshake. And, I, and perhaps I'm, I'm misinterpreting it, but it did seem to me that the Vice President let him hang there for just a minute before he clasped his hand in, in a gesture of goodwill. So it was obviously a very difficult day for him, and uh, he goes home now. So, Terry, while we watch President Bush now sign the cabinet papers, this is basically the formal nomination of his cabinet. Senator Thurmond there behind him, Dennis Hastert, the Speaker of the House on his left, Senator Lott, and Vice President Cheney. This is basically signing the formal nomination of his cabinet nominees to the Senate. The nomination hearings are not continued. But as he does this, Terry continue. How's Al Gore going to do as a person? This was his dream, his mother's dream, his father's dream, and at the last moment it was denied him. And it is something that he is going to have some difficulty, people who are close to him say, dealing with. He is, as you say, has been ambitious for the presidency for a very long time. He's one of the youngest men ever to have run for the presidency. He ran when he was uh, just 38 years old. But now he's, he's going to return, at least for a time, to private life. Uh, there's a lot of talk that he's already thinking about another run. Uh, he's a very difficult man to read in some ways. He's a, a very guarded and cautious man. Uh, and he once, I once asked him what he would do if he were not a politician. Hmm. He answered without hesitating, I'd be a writer. And perhaps we'll see some more books from him. He, after all, did write a, a best-selling book on the environment. And he'll probably have something to say about the past election as well. Thanks, Terry. Terry Moran, very much appreciated, who now goes to cover George Bush. You're looking, by the way, at one of the prized possessions of any presidential occasion, but certainly of the inauguration. The president signing each document with a different pen. Some presidents have been so careful with this tradition, Lyndon Baines Johnson among them, that sometimes he would make simply a letter with one pen and then another letter with the other. We should listen. Good job. Mr. President, what would be your first order of business when you hit the Oval Office? Thank you all. You looked a little emotional. Is that pretty tough? Felt good. Uh, yeah, felt What's good. your next priority after you? Vice President Gore, of whom we've been speaking, arriving at his home, his wife's parents' home in Arlington, Virginia. George Stephanopoulos, you may know the answer to this. I do not. Will he continue to have a Secret Service detail? 
Uh, he gets some protection. It's not as big as the president's, of course, Peter, but he does get some protection. I'm not sure how long it lasts, I think it to only, tell you the truth. I, th uh, I think it only lasts about six months. Six, six, six months, says Ted Koppel. George, you know him uh, from a uh, working relationship early on in the Clinton administration. How do you think he will fare? Well, I think, first of all, it's going to depend on on what he decides to do in the future. And the threshold question is, does he want to run again as president since he did win the popular vote and, as Terry Moran said, came so close? My guess is right now he probably does. And then everything else he chooses to do in the next several months and couple of years flow backwards from that. For example, I've heard that he's had feelers from Wall Street uh, for possible attacks on Wall Street, but maybe he would choose not to do that if he was certain that he was going to run for president again in 2004. And I don't know that he's he's made that decision yet. Um, AB ABC's John Yang is at his house in Arlington, Virginia. John, who showed up today? Uh, Peter, he's got a lot of neighbors here saying hello, welcome him back. There's a lot of affection for him. Hang on, John, until, John, John, hang on until we yes. can hear you or get the mic near you. Go ahead. Uh, how That's fine, John. Can, can you hear me now, Peter? Yes, Peter, John. there is uh, a large crowd of neighbors coming out to greet him, welcoming him home to this neighborhood. A lot of signs, yard signs, saying, welcome home, Gores. This is the house that, uh, as you said, it's his, uh, the, uh, the house of the parents of his wife, Tipper Gores' family. This is the house they came to in 1977 when he was elected to Congress. This is the house he lived in as he climbed the political ladder. And the house now that they return to, now that he's been uh, defeated for president, now left the, uh, the vice president's office. We don't know how long he'll live here. He'll live here at least through the uh, spring while his son, Albert III, finishes high school. But he's saying hello to neighbors, uh, greeting, uh, greeting uh, Peter's, greeting uh, some uh, neighbors as he comes home. Peter? Thanks, John, very much. John Yang at the uh, Gore's residence, whether it's temporary or not, he'll stay around. He's a devoted fan of his son's football accomplishments and of his son's football team. And to his credit, fathers all across the country will admire this. No matter where he was, no matter what he was doing, he didn't miss a football game. And there are a lot of fathers that cannot say that. In a moment, we and the nation will turn our eyes to the new man. I hope you'll stay with us as our inauguration coverage and celebration continues. Begin to have lunch and it's a slight diversion. What do you love most under that dome? There's so many great portraits. There are so many great statues, even some which didn't fit in Statuary Hall originally. That's true. Uh, well, I, I love the what you just saw, the painting at the top, the apotheosis of George Washington, which is which is little kids we always call George Washington in heaven. And it's a wonderful combination. It was painted by Constantine Bermidi, who was so proud to be an American that he signed his work. Constantine Brumidi citizen and his fabulous work is all over the capital. He's the originally an Italian, uh, worked uh, through the middle of the 19th century, died in 1880, I think. Uh, but that has this great combination of mythological figures and uh, real figures. For instance, there's a little moment where Mercury, of course, the messenger to the gods, is coming in and he has his traditional caduceus in one arm, but then in the other arm he has a bag of money, which he is taking from Robert Morris, who was the uh, financier of the revolution. So we have fundraising so here under is, the dome. Nothing has changed. <laughs> right. Koki, thank you very much. I look forward to talking to Koki a little afterwards. Our coverage is going to be interrupted now while we're going to come back for the inaugural parade. But before we leave, I want some final thoughts from my colleague, my friend of more than 30 some odd years. We don't like to admit that now, eh? Ted Koppel, who has spent the morning with us. We've enjoyed it. What are your thoughts? 36 years, Peter, actually, that you and I have known each other now and worked together. Uh, we talk about the, the seamlessness of the transition going from one presidency to another. I think it's worth noting that as President Bush comes into the White House now, the National Security Council, at least, will be there. It will be there. There is no institutional record. All the records are gone. All the computers are empty. There are no hard disk drives. All of the material... Everything that has been worked on by the Clinton administration over the past eight years, having foreign policy and national security, has been moved out. I guess most of it has been moved down to uh, Little Rock, I mean, down to uh, uh, Arkansas uh, for the presidential library. 
But the new folks coming in are starting, in some respects, with a blank slate. There no. is the institutional memory over at the State Department, the Pentagon, and the CIA, of course, but not at the White House. It's a little unfair to ask you to remember, to tell me what you think you will remember about the Clinton presidency in about 20 seconds. But what jumps out immediately when one says Clinton presidency? Clinton presidency, the enormous charm, the enormous skill, the enormous intelligence, the enormous ability to communicate, and ultimately, the enormous disappointment. Thanks very much, Ted. It's been a great pleasure to have you with us this morning. We are going to, as I said, interrupt our coverage now. Most of us will be back this afternoon for the parade. We'll return in just about an hour exactly. The Apparently she is an aide in the Senate. Okay. Elaine Chow in there, who is the wife of Senator Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, and she is the Secretary of Labor designee. The Marine Band, always, always, always in our background. The, no other band in the United States so associated with public occasions as this, sometimes known as the President's Own. Played at every inauguration since Thomas Jefferson's in 1801. He gave them the title, the Marine's Own. Perhaps we can just listen. photographers and reporters representing the entire news operation at the moment, traveling up close and, if not always personal, to the VIPs. President Gore, Senator Tom Daschle, who becomes probably the most influential Democrat, doesn't suddenly become, is the most influential Democrat on Capitol Hill. And take a look at Al Gore's face. Read into it what you will.
another good idea, think presidents, from the wife of a vice president, often said that Julia Tyler, the wife of the tenth president, John Tyler, was the one who ordered Hail to the Chief to be played every time the president made an official appearance. First played at James Polk's inauguration in 1845. Very, not very often you see the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court wearing a hat like that. given the closeness of this election, the president and the vice president there, Mrs. Gore always with her camera, a time for cross-party generalities and, and friendly gestures. Who knows how well they are intended, but there was Mrs. Clinton, Senator Clinton, saying goodbye to the president. Mrs. Clinton will, of course, now stay in Washington. The president later today will go back to Chappaqua in New, in New York, just outside New York City, one of, their, one of their residences. They have a house here now, and we'll have an apartment in, in New York City. And the president will experience what other presidents who've had to leave sudden changes in their lives. He'll get through traffic tonight, but he may not Ladies tomorrow. The Vice President-Elect of the United States, the Honorable Richard Bruce Cheney, accompanied by Senator Trent Blount, Representative Richard Army, Loretta Sims, De Senate Deputy Sergeant-at-Arms, Harry Hanley, House Deputy Sergeant-at-Arms, and Lanny Hurst, Executive Director, Joint Congressional Committee for Inaugural Ceremonies. President Cheney, an old, old Washington hand, sometimes said, particularly among the skeptical about George W. Bush here, that he'll be the one with real influence in the city. It's not to say that George W. Bush hasn't had experience here, but Dick Cheney knows this town extremely well, served in the House of Representatives, served as the secretary in various cabinets and certainly knows that this town is not, not always paid with goodwill. Washingtonians, that's Bill Livinggood there, who is the sergeant in arms. We'll hear him on the first State of the Union address that Mr. Bush gives to the country and to the Congress. Well, the weather has cooperated. We'd anticipated rain turning to sleet at this particular time, but a bareheaded occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, the President-elect of the United States, George Walker Bush, accompanied by Senator Mitch McConnell, Senator Christopher Dodd, Speaker J. Dennis Hester, Senator Trent Locke, Representative Richard Army, Representative Richard Gephardt, 
Jim Ziegler, Senate Sergeant at Arms. Bill Livingood, House Sergeant at Arms. And Tamara Somerville, Chief of Staff, Joint Congressional Committee for Inaugural Ceremonies. those in the country who may be saying to themselves who would have thunk it at the moment but there is the about to be president who is an opportunity to to set a country that is pretty deeply divided in many ways marching to new music Just a little late now, but this will move along fairly quickly now with the invocation by Senator Franklin Graham and then Everyone. the Chief Justice swearing in. So we'll just sit and enjoy this with you. Welcome to the 54th inauguration of the President and Vice President of the United States of America. Today we honor the past in commemorating two centuries of inaugurations in Washington, D.C. As well, we embrace the future, this day marking the first inauguration of the 21st century and the new millennium. America has now spanned four centuries, her promise still shining bright, the beginning and present linked by timeless ideals and faith. The enduring strength of our Constitution, which brings us to the west front of the Capitol today, attests to the wisdom of America's founders and the heroism of generations of Americans who fought wars and toiled in peace to preserve this legacy of liberty. In becoming the 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush will assume the sacred trust as guardian of our Constitution. Dick Cheney will be sworn in as our new Vice President. Witnessed by the Congress, Supreme Court, governors, and presidents past, the current president will stand by as the new president peacefully takes office. This is a triumph of our democratic republic, a ceremony befitting a great nation. In his father's stead, the Reverend Franklin Graham is with us today to lead the nation in prayer. Please stand for the invocation, Reverend Graham. Billy Graham, who's so close to so many presidents, is not well. This is his son, who's worked hard on taking over the ministry in time. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God. Yours, O God, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. As President Lincoln once said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth and power as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended powers, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. O oh Lord, as we come together on this historic and solemn occasion to inaugurate once again a president and vice president, teach us afresh that power, wisdom, and salvation come only from your hand. We pray, O oh Lord, for President-elect George W. Bush and Vice President-elect Richard B. Cheney, to whom you have entrusted leadership of this nation at this moment in history. We pray that you will help them bring our country together so that we may rise above partisan politics and seek the larger vision of your will for our nation. Use them to bring reconciliation between the nations. 
healing to political wounds, that we may truly become one nation under God. Give our new president and all who advise him calmness in the face of storms, encouragement in the face of frustration, and humility in the face of success. Give them the wisdom to know and to do what is right, and the courage to say no to all that is contrary to your statutes and holy law. Lord, we pray for their families and especially their wives, Laura Bush and Lynn Cheney, that they may sense your presence and know your love. Today, we entrust to you, President and Senator Clinton, and Vice President and Mrs. Gore, lead them as they journey through new doors of opportunity to serve others. Now, O oh Lord, we dedicate this President's inaugural ceremony to you. May this be the beginning of a new dawn for America as we humble ourselves before you and acknowledge you alone as our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer. We pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Franklin Graham, who runs the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association for his father. Thank you, Reverend Graham. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the DuPont Manual Choir of Louisville, Kentucky. Senator McConnell's alma mater and the only choir to perform at this ceremony. You will recognize the music.
Christopher J. Dodd of Connecticut to introduce the Chief Justice of the United States. Chief Justice Rehnquist. Thank you, Senator McConnell, President and Senator Clinton, Vice President and Mrs. Gore, President-elect and Mrs. Bush, and fellow citizens. The Vice President-elect will now take the oath of office. His wife, Lynn, and their daughters, Elizabeth Cheney Perry and Mary Cheney, will hold the family Bible. I have the honor and privilege to now present the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, the Honorable William Hobbs Rehnquist, to administer the oath of office to the Vice President-elect, Richard Bruce Cheney. The 16th Chief Justice of the United States, appointed in 1986 by President Ronald Reagan. Mr. Cheney, are you ready to take the oath? I am. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Richard Bruce Cheney, do solemnly swear. I, Richard Bruce Cheney, do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter the duties of the office on which I am about to enter so help me God so help me God congratulations Mr. Ruffles and flourishes. And now Hail Columbia played for the Vice President, first played for Vice President Nixon during the Eisenhower administration. Ladies and gentlemen, Staff Sergeant Alec T. Molly of the United States Army Band will now perform an American medley. Staff Sergeant Molly from Basking Ridge, New Jersey, been in the Army since 1995.
public occasion be without the music of Irving Berlin? He wrote it during World War I. It is now my high honor to again present uh, the Chief Justice of the United States who will administer the presidential oath of office. Everyone, please stand. This is the fourth time that the Chief Justice has administered the oath of office to the President, and the first was for George Herbert Walker Bush in 1989. Are you ready to take the oath? I am, sir. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. I, George Walker Bush, solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution.